Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you, and thanks all for joining this featured faculty presentation, the first of what I hope will be a series of talks by our great faculty here at the Center for Advanced Governmental Studies. Uh, once again, my name is Colin Pascal, and I am a program coordinator and senior lecturer here at the center. And I split my time between the MA in government program and the MS in data analytics and policy program. I'm here with Dr. Dorothea Wolfson, who is the director of the MA in government program, uh, along with Tasha Overpeck, who is AAP Zoom 2, who is our event planner and will be helping with uh, Zoom administration. So uh, thanks Tasha for all of your work organizing and promoting this event. And most importantly, we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Doug Harris, who today is going to be doing a presentation based on his upcoming book, At War with Governments, How Conservatives Weaponize Distrust from Goldwater to Trump, which he co-authored with Amy Freed from the University of Maine and will be coming out soon, I believe, uh, in later this summer in August from Columbia University Press. Dr. Harris is a longtime adjunct faculty, mem faculty member uh, in our MA in government program and a very important part of our team here at Hopkins. So we're glad he's here. Uh, we share Doug with Loyola University, Maryland, where he is a professor of political science. Um, Doug has an impressive record of scholarly, scholarly work, including authoring and editing several books and having published articles in important disciplinary journals, such as Political Science and Politics, Legislative Studies Quarterly, Congress and the Presidency, and many others. Uh, I should also mention that Doug received his PhD from Johns Hopkins University, so our connections go back quite a ways, and we are very happy that he's here today to share his expertise and his recent scholarship with us. Uh, in terms of format, in just a few minutes, a uh, few moments, I will give Doug the floor so he can begin his presentation, and he will put up a PowerPoint presentation on the screen that we can follow along with. And once he is done, uh, I have a few follow-up questions for Doug to get the conversation started. And I believe Dr. Wolfson may also have a few things that she'd like to ask about um, to get the discussion going. And after a bit of back and forth between us, we will turn to the audience for questions and comments, which you can submit through the Q&A function of the webinar. So um, Tasha will help us moderate those and I'll also moderate the questions and repeat them so that we all have a chance to, to join the conversation. So I'm looking forward to a thought provoking discussion of uh, this very timely work. And with that, I'm very pleased to turn things over to Dr. Harris. So take it away, Doug. So uh, I'd like to start just by thanking Colin and Dorothea for asking me to talk about my forthcoming book today. Um, as Colin indicated, I have a long time association with Johns Hopkins, including doing my own PhD here. So it's always a big deal for me um, to talk to the Hopkins community. Um, the, and I'd also like to thank Tasha, who's working behind the scenes uh, for this event. So um, the, the, the book uh, called At War With Government, uh, How Conservatives Weaponize Distrust from Goldwater to Trump, is uh, co-authored with Amy Freed, uh, who chairs the Department of Political Science at the University of Maine. Um, it's forthcoming uh, soon and occupying a lot of my time uh, right now. Um, but as, as is the case with many projects, this book is actually just the latest product of a broader research collaboration between Professor Fried and myself that dates back to the late 1990s, actually, uh, last century, uh, when we were both on faculty at Colgate University in multiple conversations back then, likely over coffee, uh, we, we identified a common area of interest between her scholarship in the area of public opinion and polling, and my interest in congressional communications and leadership. Um, and that topic was the overt strategy at the time uh, by Newt Gingrich and other political elites to seize on public dissatisfaction with the political system, to stoke it, and to use extant distrust in the system to achieve political power. This first Publica the first publication from this project in 2001 was a chapter called On Red Capes and Charging Bulls in John Hibbing and Beth Tice Morse uh, edited collection, What Is It About Government That Americans Disliked, which looked specifically at the Gingrich strategy and the tendency of distrust in public opinion to increasingly fall along partisan lines where Democrats would distrust the institutions that government that Republicans controlled 
and Republicans would distrust the institutions that Democrats controlled, and then they'd switch uh, when when uh, majority control of an institution uh, changed. Um, since then, we've been asked to trot out this idea to explain Tea Party politics in the Obama era, and especially since Trump's 2016 campaign and election. When Trump won in 2016, the, the, the idea that somebody would actively stoke distrust sort of took off and uh, people were interested. And we were asked to contribute to a special edition of Clio, which is the newsletter of the American Political Science Association's politics and history section, um, writing in that transition period uh, between Trump's election and his inauguration in 2017, uh, we were invited to present uh, a, an elaboration of our work on, on Trump and this topic at Oxford University's Rothermere American Institute, and most recently to write a piece on the 2020 elections in the journal Society to discuss the then only very likely to occur phenomenon of President Trump seeking to undermine confidence in the election. In that most recent article, written while quarantined during the summer of 2020, um, we made a series of predictions about the election as an object of manipulated distrust in the political system. First, we argued that Trump supporters were more likely to question the legitimacy of the election. And that was not just uh, because we foresaw that, that Trump was likely to lose, um, but that this had been primed uh, in the opinions that they, they held. Um, second, Trump supporters were less likely to use vote by mail options uh, that were necessary as a result of the pandemic. And as a result, uh, and that was largely a result of his own statements about the process um, many on Twitter. Um, third, uh, we argued that Trump will seize, uh, Trump would seize on the variability in election vote count process, uh, uh, processes to question his loss. Uh, and I'll, I'll show a little bit of that on the next slide. Um, and fourth, that we said very sort of generally and vaguely that there was a potential for social disruption, though, uh, we hadn't really anticipated uh, January 6th. I was quite proud in retrospect at the, at the specificity of this prediction related to point number three from the last slide um, where, where I wrote, uh, again, this is late June, mid July uh, uh, 2020. Uh, I wrote, because Republicans are more likely than Democrats to vote on election day, a third possibility is the initial vote counts would favor Trump, but would become increasingly pro-Biden as mailed ballots are counted in the days afterwards. This discrepancy between the same day count and later counts is likely to be exacerbated because young voters, among whom Trump is especially weak, who vote by mail tend to do so later in the process and thus their votes are counted later. In all, as protracted vote counting process continue after election day, Democrats are likely to gain ground in tabulations. It seems reasonable to expect that Trump would then claim that the election was being rigged or stolen. Recently, Trump has contended we need to know the outcome of the election on election night or there would be a potential for corruption. This is likely a sign that Trump has been made aware that he is likely to do better with election day voters than with voters who opt to vote by mail, vote absentee or vote early. Based on everything we had seen about how Trump reacted to electoral loss uh, when he lost the Iowa caucuses to Ted Cruz and he, he demanded a do-over and, and a lot of other things, even, where, even including questioning his electoral victory uh, in 2016, we, we said it's regrettable but obvious uh, that Trump is likely to challenge the legitimacy of any outcome that doesn't end in his victory. But as I, as I said, this is, this is part of the larger project, the, the focus of which has been the book uh, at war with government. Um, if, if Trump's efforts have pushed this strategy of manipulating distrust beyond that employed by other Republicans and conservatives in the past, we argue that this weaponization of distrust has been a strategic effort. I, have, I believe that it's been the primary strategy of the GOP since Goldwater. In our book, Amy and I join in the observation that public trust in government has been in free fall since the 1960s. And we add our own voices to the multifaceted effort to explain those trends. 
Of course, declining public confidence matters for a number of reasons, including the health of the Republic itself. Uh, but foremost among those reasons is also the fact that governance itself requires trust. So central to my thinking on this topic uh, was sociolo sociologist William Gamson's work in his late 1960s book, Power and Discontent. Gamson, who sadly just passed away a few weeks ago, claimed in that book that trust is the creator of collective power and that the loss of trust is the loss of, loss of system power, the loss of a generalized capacity for authorities to commit resources to attain collective goals. What the government seeks to do hinges importantly on public trust. This is especially true in regard, uh, as Mark Hetherington has argued, in regard to redistributive policies, where the, law, where, where the trust that we have in fellow citizens, what, what I call lateral trust, is also involved. For the most part, though, the literature on declining public trust in government has argued that it's an unintended consequence of either economic performance, wherein public dissatisfaction with economic downturns actually lasts longer than public approval of good economic performance. So it's always cycling downward, even if the economy recovers somewhat. Um, or they argue that general frustrations with government performance and, and process functions has produced distrust and the negativity that inundates the public airwaves, particularly as citizens seek out the angry media voices with whom, uh, with whom they agree um, to, to stoke distrust in the, the office holders with whom they disagree. Not arguing with any of these points, we seek to add another perspective. Um, and that is that the rising levels of distrust and declining levels of trust, which of course are two ways of saying the same thing, has been an overt strategy employed in the contemporary era by Republicans and conservatives to undermine public confidence. It's important to note that we're, we're saying more than Democrats are pro-government and Republicans are for less government. Indeed, we see this as more of a strategic move by Republicans than an, than an ideological commitment for three big reasons. The first is, if you trace it historically, Republicans were once the party of big government, and they, they switched on these questions at key points in history, generally when Democrats sought to expand the power of the state. Second, Republicans are not anti-government across the board, but they are only selectively so. They still like government when it comes to police powers and military, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and they are far from libertarian on social issues. Uh, and then the third point is we see the GOP flexibly change their, their ostensibly originalist understandings of the separation of powers and maneuver their, their anti-government principles, uh, depending strategically and tactically and situationally on whether or not they control the government generally or a specific institution. Indeed, we argue that there are four benefits of distrust, organizational benefits, electoral benefits, institutional benefits, and policy benefits that recur in the more than half century wherein this has been the strategy of the modern GOP. Um, the GOP coalition, like any big multifaceted political coalition, is something that's built and it had to be built. And even at times when we look back and think that it was a natural coalition, it, it really was a constructed thing. And what, what we have found is that that construction has hinged since Goldwater on anti-government views. Other issues, social issues, are more likely to divide Republicans or scare off independents. So this is always the go-to strategy for, uh, for the Republicans, Reagan, Gingrich, uh, even Trump, when they're trying to sustain a coalition. Second, uh, electoral benefits. The conservatives tap into existing anti-government sentiment to raise money, build support, uh, for, for their campaigns and influence the vote. And this is especially pronounced these days in uh, Republican primaries. Um, the, 
to even be pragmatic is to uh, invite questions about your conservatism. I remember when Richard Lugar was a conservative uh, and one of the more conservative Republican senators and somehow uh, he became unacceptably uh, government oriented uh, and, and was challenged uh, in a primary. And that's just one of several examples. Uh, the third series of benefits are institutional benefits. And one of the issues here is the divided government complicates the strategy, right? Um, because the Republicans have been in, in power in some respect, either controlling a chamber of Congress or controlling the White House throughout most of this era. Um, and, but conservatives, and, and I would hasten to add liberals too, engage in um, what Richard Piper calls situational constitutionalism, where they very flexibly celebrate the power of the institutions they control where, while tearing down the institutions they they don't control, and then switching on a dime uh, to, to do the opposite when, when electoral fortunes change. And then there are policy benefits. And we, we talk a bit about how policy battles are increasingly won and lost on, on these questions of trust, right? Whether the government can be trusted to deploy the benefits and if the beneficiaries are worthy. And we spend a lot of time talking about healthcare in the book. Lest we be misunderstood, we do stress four caveats. Distrust can be rational, right? The distrustful are not necessarily wrong to do so. There's a great political science book from many years ago by Vivian Hart, which, uh, in which she argues that distrust is a rational response to governance failure and, and, and it's democratic. Uh, and we don't think that the that citizens owe their trust to the government. Um, and, and we don't want it to be implied that, uh, that that's just something that, that citizens owe to political elites. Second, we, we readily recognize that distrust knows no ideological home. The left does it or has done it too, right? Populists, if you wanna count them as left, I know that's controversial, progressives, organized labor uh, at the turn of the century, uh, 1960s anti-Vietnam and counterculture, liberals uh, mistrusted and, and, and outright hated the system. It's just that in the current context, um, this is a strategy that works better uh, for Republicans and conservatives. Um, third, distrust exemplifies the interplay of opinion politics between elites and mass. We don't say that elites foist distrust onto an otherwise trusting electorate, but instead, we argue that they harness the cultural distrust and, and anti-government skepticism uh, of American politics and use public opinion techniques uh, to, to identify opportunities, to manipulate that sentiment, and then to deploy it. Um, that is why we use the term weaponization sometimes. Um, and then the strategy of distrust has limits. Once distrust is deployed, political elites can lose control of it as the rest of public is apt to turn perhaps even on them. We spend time, we, we, we take this set of arguments for a spin in, 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 in a brief trip throughout American history, right? Uh, we've got a chapter where we, we begin with Edmund Burke and James Madison, uh, take a stop in, uh, in Civil War America with Abraham Lincoln and take it all the way up to Barry Goldwater, trying to show that uh, this is a long-term uh, uh, issue in American politics and a, free, and a not infrequently used uh, strategy uh, throughout American political history. And then we really zero in on four case studies, the Reagan era, the Gingrich-led Republican revolution, the Tea Party opposition to Obama, and the Trump era. In each of these cases, we examine the internal polling and strategy planning documents uh, as well as histories, party platforms, and speeches, and found strikingly consistent evidence of conservatives taking the public's temperature in terms of governmental trust and distrust, identifying weak spots, uh, and mobilizing arguments to cultivate and to weaponize that distrust, to build organizations, to win elections, to engage in institutional combat, and to thwart policy change, especially in regard to healthcare. Ronald Reagan, for example, once a supporter of New Deal policies, rose, rose to power first in California and then in the national GOP against Gerald Ford in 76, 
with staunch anti-government views that first took conservatives by surprise, conservatives like Ford, who, who at the time was thought of as a conservative. Uh, as president, Reagan worked to build a realignment. His advisors and the president himself actually used the political science terminology of realignment to, uh, uh, in, in their own private planning uh, to undo the New Deal and to replace it with smaller government. If, but if Reagan was clear voiced in articulating his small government philosophy, we note throughout our chapter on Reagan that he was also pragmatic, much more so than the contemporary GOP, and sensed the staying power of the New Deal state and Social Security, for example, uh, and then Medicare, uh, and, and, and its political support in the country. Ultimately, Reagan made many concessions to government and indeed expanded the state in important ways. Uh, this picture here is Ronald Reagan's uh, making the, the veterans, uh, signing the Veterans Affairs Act, which made the, the VA cabinet level. Um, I always thought of this when, when I thought of Ronald Reagan, because if that cameraman turned just a little bit, he would see freshman American University freshman Doug Harris in the audience uh, as, as Reagan signing that. Uh, that was uh, October of 1988. Um, this, uh, Reagan's expansions of the state included retrenchment on his 81 tax cuts and uh, an effort even by Reagan to champion an expansion of Medicare with what was called the Medicare Catastrophic Coverage Act in 1988. When Newt Gingrich and Republicans sought to complete the Reagan realignment, again, sometimes explicitly talking behind the scenes in those terms, um, it was built on clear opposition to the first two years of the Clinton administration, but also 40 years of Democratic rule in the House. The Gingrich Revolution, whatever it was for, it was anti-Congress, anti-Clinton, and anti-government. And as opposed to being built on social issues, which were assiduous, assiduously avoided in the contract with America, or even opposition to the Brady Bill, which certainly excited some parts of the Republican coalition, the contract with America itself was decidedly anti-government with a focus on economics because it was ultimately distrust in big government that would win over the Perot voters that they coveted so much and help to build a majority. Social issues and other matters uh, were bound, they thought, to scare off those groups. And the public opinion experts like Frank Luntz here um, uh, were, were training the Republicans what to say and what not to say, and the what to says were almost always focused on the size and scope of government. It's notable here, too, that Gingrich, who had penned the foreword to a book criticizing the Imperial Congress during the Reagan years, reversed course to advocate a stronger Congress and, of course, a stronger speakership once he had achieved the GOP majority. He actually cited Federalist Papers as clear foundational support for both uh, interpretations of separation of powers, a stronger presidency during the Reagan years and a stronger Congress once the Republicans were in control. Thus, Republicans who complained that oversight when conducted by Democrats of the Reagan administration was abusive and little more than a show, uh, Republicans had called it Barnumocracy uh, in reference to P.T. Barnum. Um, internally, they were quite frank once they took control um, of their own plans to use those oversight tools for their own PR purposes once they held committee gavels. And this is an excerpt from the book where they say that they're going to use the committee hearings to expose and punish the consequences of democratic rule, including exposing the bad people and their bad policies, emphasizing, yes, bad people, not just people with whom we disagree. Republicans planned, and this is just their language from an internal document, month after shocking month of putting Democrats on trial in what they called our Nuremberg. Um, and, and, Later in the 90s, they continued this strategy, and this is a Dick Army document uh, where basically a staffer says that uh, the object of their committee um, concerns should be uh, the arch enemy, the man with the black hat, the sinister man twirling his long mustache, uh, and that was the Washington bureaucrat, and they stress not congressmen, definitely not the Republican Party. This longstanding strategy was again employed uh, by the Tea Party in the Obama era. The bailout politics after, two, after the 2008 financial collapse and then Obamacare and notably 
Obama's sometimes aggressive uses of the presidential powers that conservatives had championed since Reagan, all of those things incensed the small government right and led to the rise of the Tea Party, which traditional conservatives saw as a much needed source of enthusiasm, and then they worked to harness its power. But as we argued back in 2001, such efforts to stoke a distrustful and angry electorate are prone to backfire as elites con lose control of the followers who then turn their ire on them, consuming in one way or another the careers of rising conservative leaders, Eric Cantor, Speaker John Boehner, Speaker Paul, and Speaker Paul Ryan even during the Trump years. Returning our focus to Trump as a means of concluding, we note that Trump's anti-establishment tone and populist following had strong antecedents in the prior GOP strategies. When in 2001, we argued that this strategy of distrust could have the effect of deteriorate, deteriorating the system and weakening American democracy, we didn't really anticipate the aftermath of the 2020 election and the January 6th insurrection specifically. But by the summer of 2020, it had become obvious that the effects of this strategy were, to paraphrase Norm Ornstein and Tom Mann, even worse than we thought. Trumpism was built on tendencies already at work in the GOP. They exhibited continuities with a politics that stretches all the way back to, in two different strains, Barry Goldwater and the John Birch Society. But Trump was different. Uh, the anti-government rhetoric was more extreme and the anti-immigrant and race-based language were less veiled. The right-wing populism that Boehner and others had found useful but ultimately deadly to their careers took center stage. The president was apt to question the legitimacy of elections themselves with dangerous consequences, as I discussed at the beginning. Notably, Trump took the anti-government strategy to new heights or new lows uh, however you want to see it, uh, by targeting distrust uh, at even those elements of government, like the FBI and the intelligence community, and to some extent, even the military, uh, that had heretofore been avoided by a GOP will willing to tear down other parts of the political system and to, and to uh, tear down public trust uh, in that system. Um, but that's what we're, we're, we're up to in this book. We're, we're really trying to make the case that this is um, the dominant strategy of the post-Goldwater GOP and that it has some pretty significant uh, consequences for the American political system. And I'll stop there, uh, turn it over to Colin for questions. Well, great, Doug. I, I really appreciate that presentation. I, I found the excerpts of the book that I was able to read um, really compelling. And I think you bring together so many different threads of history and political science scholarship and contemporary events in a, a really compelling way. And I uh, I just I thank you for sharing your, your work and your presentation. Um, for audience members, if you're interested in asking Doug a question, you can do so through the Q&A function of the Zoom. Um, so go ahead and start entering your questions now, and I'll go through those um, as uh, after we talk a bit. But uh, I think Dr. Wilson and I may have a few questions to start out with, and I'll, I'll just be begin by asking kind of something perhaps a little foundational, but I think an important conceptual question. And, and that is, I wonder if you might talk more about what you mean by the concept of political trust, Doug. I mean, it's, it's complicated, right? I mean, survey questions asking about political trust are often framed around asking a respondent, how much of the time do you trust the people in Washington to do the right thing? And people will be given a scale, you know, all the time or almost none of the time, somewhere in between. Um, and so that's one way of measuring trust, but it doesn't really define trust exactly. Um, and other research has said that trust is really sort of about teamsmanship, which you've kind of described in your talk. It's about, you know, personal affect. It's about how much you identify sort of uh, in a, Identif identification-based uh, resonance in politics. So I wonder if you could just talk more about what you mean by trust in the, the con context of your book. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question and it is the foundational question. And um, when we were doing the research, part of, part of what we found so frustrating was the mismatch of what I think people generally mean by trust in government with the available data from ANES or the General Social Survey where, where questions are asked. And 
Um, there was this longstanding debate between whether or not the, the, the trust we think about in the political system was a trust in the institutions generally, and if people, people still thought in those terms and those abstract constitutionalist and institutionalist terms, or if they were always proxies for whether or not I like who's in power. And for me, um, for me, I'm interested in the interaction between those two things, how uh, who's in political power affects the broader system, because ultimately, I'm an institutionalist, right? This is this is how I teach my classes. This is how I approach American politics. This is why I'm, I'm, I'm even writing a book that that seems more partisan than I'm generally comfortable with, because I think that this goes to the heart of our our um, our belief in the overall political system. And that's what I'm most interested in at that level. But for me, just in answer, answer that part of the question, it goes back to uh, Bill Gamson's uh, quote that I gave earlier, which is, this is a generalized sense that the government will do what is right and do it effectively. And with that, you have the capacity to achieve a lot of things like win World War II and, and, and rebuild Europe. Uh, and without that, um, you, you have a lot of distrust and, um, and an inability to solve collective problems. The other element that I quickly wanna mention is, is, you mentioned affect. This is this concept of lateral trust, which is part of this involves whether or not we trust our fellow citizens. And I think this gets a little bit into the social capital literature and even identity politics, um, where, wherein if we, if we don't like the recipients of a public policy, we're less likely to support the policy. If we think of people as more likely to abuse a public policy, we're less likely to abuse the public policy. So when Tea Party activists would, would go to anti-Obamacare rallies with keep the government's hands off my Medicare, um, <laughs> uh, the, the argument wasn't an argument against government. The argument was an argument against some government. Um, and that if, if you approve of, uh, of, of maybe the details of the policy, though I don't think a lot of citizens know about Medicare funding formulas, uh, but, it, it, but if you approve of the beneficiaries of the policy and the people you have in your mind who benefit from the policies, then you're more likely to support them and, and not really think of that, that as governmental. And I think that's, that's one of the lessons that we argue that the Democrats need to needs need to take, and anyone who wants to who wants to talk about good governance, right? I think of John Boehner and Bob Michael, and I think of a long long history of Republicans who wanted to govern really well. Um, that you need you need to you need to say when government does things well. Um, you need you need to you need to claim that as well, and uh, you can't simply join the chorus of running for Congress by running against Congress, running to control the government by running against it. Great, well, thank, thanks for, for that answer. I, I think it's, uh, I think you're, it resonates very much with what, with what I understand about trust and with the theme of the book. So um, Dorothy, would you like to, do you have any comments or questions you'd like to sure. add? Yeah, that was really interesting. And I think, thank you, Doug and, and, and Colin. Um, I think what you were saying about you're an institutionalist, and you mentioned in your talk um, Edmund Burke, and you know you, you 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 say how this has been going on since Goldwater since the 1950s. But I was also thinking about you know one of the the the, the great founders of the American conservative modern movement, which would be you know Russell Kirk, who was a Burkean and really believed in the veneration of institutions. We're lost without institutions, and he was at war with the libertarians, right? He 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 did not like libertarians, and he wanted to keep them out of the conservative movement. But of course, as you're if you've demonstrated so well, they've become sort of the primary voice. But there was some pushback, as you noted, like with Ronald Reagan, for example, we always think of him as sort of, but he actually, you know, was at, was at home in, with the New Deal at least before and, he, and also continued when he was in office. So are there any sort of, do you see any trends within the conservative movement of sort of pushing back? Uh, you know, you mentioned that the anti-government, uh, you know, it, it views are sort of, that, that's where the whole uh, coalition hinges on that. But do you see pushback? I think there, there, there may be some pushback. Um, right now, Trump is, uh, uh, is, is consuming so much of the oxygen in the room that, that I don't think the, the argument has really been, has really coalesced. 
but I see governance conservatives um, like Liz Cheney. I see governance conservatives. Uh, uh, the first person we quote in the book is Ben Sass, who oh, uses the wonderful. term weaponization. Um, I think that there are there are there are people who believe in the political system that um, that that understand that that part of what we're supposed to do is is uh, uh, is preserve the system for our posterity, right? That's part of that's part of our constitutional charge, right. and uh, and it can't simply be that the American political system is 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 simply mortgaged and remortgaged in uh, uh, for for short term effect. I would hope that um, that there is there is a stronger movement for that kind of problem solving governance. It need not be bipartisan. Um, but bipartisanship seems to be uh, one of our first indicators that people actually care about something other than winning elections. And, and um, so, so I would like to see that. Uh, I, I think that, um, and again, the names that come to mind are all associated right now with being anti-Trump. So I could also add Mitt Romney to the, to the list. I, but for me, on the left and the right, the evaluation that's always mattered to me is: Do you believe in the system, and and uh, and, and 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 do you want to improve it? Yeah. Um, and uh, and that that makes me disappointed with some from the left in history. That makes me disappointed with some from the right in history. But um, you're you're absolutely right. Uh, you 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 spotted the Burkeanism that's in there, which is I. I think the political system's better off with a with a really good conservative, robust Republican Party, yeah. <laughs> um, and and I don't I don't see I don't see it I don't see it all that conservative I don't see it all that robust and I don't see it as much of a party right now. Yeah, no, I I, I appreciate that because I never thought the anti-government was part. I thought that that always sort of violated the conservative spirit as I understood it coming, you know, from Burke and, and that tradition. And I guess that's the only have one other question, which again, you did such a great job showing how trust has been weaponized among the, the right and conservatives. Um, and you had the caveat, the slide about the caveats in there too, and that this is not just ideologically aligned with just the right, that the left has had their movements, whether it's the populist movement or the countercultural movement of the 1960s. There, you know, the famous mantra was don't trust anyone over 35. Um, and, you, you know, it seems like it's ongoing, that it's not just a, what, you know, we're talking about trust and its importance and, and uh, the, uh, Gam Gamson's uh, definition, it seems like, okay, that's important for everybody. And with the left now too, um, just to get your thoughts of, of that sort of uh, continuing along with some of the, uh, what we've seen as well with the sort of, um, you know, sort of distress of systemically of institutions and, and we're seeing a lot more of that too. So I guess the question is how do we all come together <laughs> left, right? Are there certain strategies that you're looking at or not strategies, but things you're looking at with the right right now to, to overcome this distress that would also apply to, to, to where the left is on some of these issues of their distress of institutions? It's such a great question. Um, you know, uh, probably 14 months ago, I would say, uh, uh, if there was a real catastrophic crisis, America would come together. Uh, and uh, and um, not that I was hoping for one. I, I had just given a Constitution Day talk at, at Shippensburg University uh, uh, more than a year ago where, um, where I had said that one of the things that actually united Republicans and Democrats in Congress, at least in, in the mid 20th century, was a shared um, a, a shared history as veterans of World War II, and uh, Bob Michael didn't see Tip O'Neill as his enemy because Bob Michael had experienced an enemy. Um, yeah. He had, ex and and uh, it was it was relatively easy for Newt Gingrich to say, "Well, step aside. I I, I see them as 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 enemies." I I would hope that um, that that as we come back, come out of the pandemic and we get to a point where there is some self-reflection and hopefully some, some even, even greater prosperity and maybe, maybe an understanding that, that the government, um, the government uh, over delivered 
delivered on a big promise when it came to vaccines, uh, that that maybe we could see that there there was some benefit to a government that got us through the what 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 hopefully is the hardest time of our lives. Uh, and uh, I'm 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 hoping that there will be a, a shared sense of the importance of governance, and we can get back to arguing about marginal tax rates and we can get back to margin arguing about who who deserves to be uh taxed and what taxes are smart and we can we can get back to 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 arguing the the effectiveness of policies rather than um rather than just arguing as as one of the people we quote in the book says you know now that the now that now that the Soviets have, have have gone away, um, Washington's the new evil empire. Yeah. Um, that 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 cannot be. That's that's a representational crisis and a governance crisis all at once. And and we need to do better than that. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Very. I I I too share. I, I would just like to say that I share your your hope, Doug, that we're able to. Um, come to some changes in our, our political life that maybe are allowing for more of that uh, civil discourse over over tax rates. I would love an argument about tax rates. Let's let's go for it. Although I will say you are seeing that just a little bit in the political world right now, although it is interesting that's limited to some extent to within the Democratic Party. There's some debate about 28% corporate tax versus the 25% corporate tax. So it's interesting, there's this internal debate within the Democrats, but then a much more extreme position is sort of presented, I think, by a lot of the Republican Party. So that asymmetry is, is interesting. Um, I wanted to turn kind of on that note to a couple of the questions that we have, and I'm kind of synthesizing here a little bit, um, but there is a lot of interest in sort of how do we get out of this? And so what I wanted to ask you about was, do you think there are any sort of institutional changes that we might be able to uh, adopt as a country that might help to facilitate um, greater trust and what might those institutional changes be? Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. You know, we, we spend uh, a lot of time in the, uh, in the conclusion sort of trying to figure out um, where trust is, is as, as almost a counterculture move being built. Um, and we've, we've seen some studies that suggest that uh, actually a more robust and personalized kind of campaigning can help people to understand policies that, that again, it, it will come back to, and, and I know 2020 wasn't the year for this, but it will come back for, to, to door knocking and having deep conversations with people. And, um, and, and I'm, I'm a big fan of asking questions, which is if somebody makes an assertion, our first response in, in the Twitter social media age is to, is to make a counter assertion. Um, and and I'm a bigger fan of of trying to diffuse that and 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 unpack it by asking, um, and 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 I think this is some of what the these campaigns do. Asking, how did you come to that conclusion? What makes what about the world or what about the government or what about your experience with policy makes you makes you see things in that way? And um, and. I think that people have attitudes more than they have beliefs, and if we ask them questions, they you would you would compel them to to test their attitudes and 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 to find out whether or not they were beliefs. Uh, I'm a, I'm also a big believer, believe it or not, in in, in political parties. Um, that the real problem is we have we have uh, um, we have political parties that escape responsibility for choices made, and for governance failures, and um, that that makes sense because you know the Republican Party didn't pick Donald Trump. Donald Trump picked the Republican Party. Um, our parties have become so porous that 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 and 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 so open to a hostile takeover or a takeover from a Democratic Socialist uh, who who got surprisingly far in in um, in his campaign. Uh, they get they get so far in part because the political parties don't have a lot of control. And I think if we had more, more vital, especially state and local party organizations, that that might help build responsibility in, in, in a federalized way that might extend up, up, up the chain to our, to our national parties. And then um, you'll, you'll forgive the, the, the political science educator for saying this. I, I'm a big believer, in, and I know everybody says they are, but I'm a big believer in, in civic education. And I think our civic education needs to be education 
not about how how politics actually works, but our education needs to be our civic education needs to be more institutional, more historical, more constitutional, and more moral. Uh, and we need to ask people to develop principles, especially for me. And this this emanates from one of our key arguments in the book: principles about how you feel about the Constitution that you you will keep for longer than two or four years at a time. Uh, do you believe in congressional oversight? And you can't follow up by asking, well, are the Democrats in control or are the Republicans in control? Do you believe in congressional oversight? What's appropriate? What's what's inappropriate? Do you believe that a president should engage in governance through executive order? Um, what's appropriate? What's inappropriate? And it's only a principle. It's only a constitutional principle. It's only a fixed understanding of the Constitution if you will apply it evenly and even when it hurts a little. I just say that's a great idea. And I, I never heard, you know, the moral component asking these hard, these questions. I love that. That should be your next project working on a curriculum, I think for civics education. That was wonderful. Yeah. I would just add going off of that. Um, I would also add to your list as a data science instructor here. I think data literacy is extremely important um, because we live in this enormously complex world today. Um, just being able to understand your role in a very complex nation requires the ability to deal with statistical uncertainty and um, understanding that there are like sampling problems, like our, our little slice of the world is not really representative of what the country is as a whole. Um, and in fact, I think that this sort of blue state, red state thing that Tim Russert started in 2000 has been a gross oversimplification of sort of the political demography of the country and has really had some ill effects on our ability to just trust one another because it really defined us as sort of the red states and blue states when the story is, I think, much more complicated. But I digress. But I would just add that to the list of, uh, of, of topics. Well, this has been one of the things that's been on my mind for the last couple of weeks, which is I keep hearing these 78% of Republicans believe that the election was stolen, 50% of, of Republicans believe that the insurrectionists had a point. Um, for me, as a political scientist, that's throwing away, away a lot of data. Don't tell me what percentage of Republicans, tell me what percentage of Americans, tell me what percentage of your, your whole sample believes those things. Um, because if the test of if the test of a Trump era Republicanism is you believe the insurrectionists had a point and you believe the election was stolen, then your denominator might be shrinking. <laughs> uh, and that number is always going to stay high and, and, and grow higher. Um, and uh, I, I agree, data literacy and just stretching the intellectual capacity of, of, of Americans, you know, uh, to understand the consequences of things, to understand science, to understand math. And uh, I'll just add, because I'm a big fan of, of Martha Nussbaum's uh, not-for-profit, again, get back to civic education, just to think about history and the humanities and create a sense of, of, of uh, an empathetic imagination that can imagine uh, that a public policy may be good, even if it's, it, it's good for somebody that you don't know. Yeah, well, let me um, turn back to some of the questions that we've we've been submitted. So I, uh, I, I sort of I just want to shout out, thank you, Tim and Vincent. I sort of synthesized your questions together for the last uh, the last one I asked. But now I want to um, move on and, and ask a question um, from Michael Palmieri, who uh, asked this early in the talk, a, a bit similar to my follow up question, but I think important. Um, Michael asks, did you see a tipping point? Do you see a tipping point where rising distrust crosses into the realm of perceived institutional delegitimacy and are trust and legitimacy synonymous or are there some differences? And I think that's an interesting question is, is there a difference between trust and legitimacy in your mind? And that's in especially sharp relief, I think in the, in the wake of uh, the insurrection on January 6th. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, uh, Legitimacy is, is, an, is, is a word that sort of started to reemerge in my conversations with Amy and the paragraphs that we would be writing independently <laughs> as we would put things together. And we realized that when we first started writing back in, in the 90s and for that, that first project, uh, uh, we were just talking about trust, right? We were, we were talking about it in a way that um, we still felt that the system could could withstand it, and, and and I still do, of course. Uh, but 
but when when the trust problem becomes so pervasive um uh in terms of in terms of broad numbers uh in terms of well played well placed officials uh and and also in terms of the sort of the sort of deep sense that um that some citizens have that that the system just isn't legitimate anymore that that to me is just a sign that this is this is reaching crisis proportions and 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 has reached crisis proportions um tipping points i i think that i think the trump era we will look back at a time um when when Trump goes and, and gives an address to to the CIA and uh, and starts questioning the intelligence community. When when um, when Trump starts questioning the FBI because because the FBI is uh, is you know adding some perspectives to the to the Mueller investigation that that make him uncomfortable. That that's a real sign that um, that that Republicans are even giving up some of the some of the some of the touchstones that they had they had held held fast to the other tipping point that i want to talk about because i believe history tips in in a lot of ways and then then we have this path dependence that un unfolds as a result the other tipping point um that i think deserves some attention is um a, a mini revolt led by newt gingrich uh during the george hw bush administration when george hw bush um Create, engages in budget summetry with the Democrats in Congress and uh, looks to balance the budget. And uh, yes, he, uh, despite our having read his lips in the 88 uh, convention, he um, he agrees to, as they said, revenue enhancements uh, in the official deal. Um, there, there is a revolt that happens against Bush in that, uh, in, in, in the House Republican Party that seemed to me to be the, a wing of the GOP exacting a price for governance. Because if, if you take the long historical view, what Bush was, here's, here's how I see it. What Bush was trying to do was he was trying to um, make good on one of Ronald Reagan's promises that Reagan couldn't make good on, which was deficit reduction. And Bush in trying to complete the Reagan project um, gets punished. <laughs> By Newt Gingrich and then Pat Buchanan, and 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 a populist Republican Party that uh, that that seemed to be a little more interested in uh, in elections and and uh, ideology than than governance, um, and those those are two characters that uh, George H. W. Bush and George W. Bush that uh, get get less attention in the book. Um, but but we do spend some time talking about those presidencies uh, um, because they were um, they were they were remarkable in their in their own ways. Great, thank you. Yeah. So in the in the interest of time, I'm just going to keep moving on through some uh, other student questions here, just to make sure that or audience questions, I should say, to make sure we get everyone's voice. Um, we had a question here from Allison about. Do you think that effective polarization between aff affective polarization between voters and opposing parties has intensified mistrust in government more generally? And I think this question kind of gets to this interesting point that you have uh, distrust between voters sort of at a mass behavior level and how that maybe transfers up to the institutional level of the government. So I wonder if you might talk a bit about um, that relationship and, and otherwise reflect on Allison's question. I, I, th I think it most certainly has has an effect. Uh, I've been, I mean, it was one of the more shocking things uh, that I saw when um, Shanto Iyengar and some colleagues had written something on affective polarization where they, sort of a meta analysis where they pulled together all of these experimental studies on um, whether or not uh, people of different parties want uh, want to date or, or to be friends with people of the opposing party or, um, would approve if their if their son or daughter married somebody from the opposing party, and the fact that that the bottom has fallen out of of that, which had had never really been a, much of a consideration before, that that hiring practices and sort of all all of the implicit bias things that we worry about in terms of hiring and gender and race 
all of that implicit bias is now coming forward in in experimental studies about scholarships and hiring and and uh, and, and and admission uh, policies. Um, this is this is really disturbing because um, because again, uh, not just a Burkean but a Madisonian. Uh, I like I like the fabric of our society to be woven uh as 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 a tapestry that if i disagree with you on something i want to agree with you on something else and we are much better off the more we have those associations and i think uh i think the social social capital literature has 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 has, has uh, uh has brought some of this to the foreground but um partisanship and 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 viewing people through first at first through the part part a partisan lens is um is is the least madisonian thing you can do um and uh that uh we need to we need more robust factions we we need more things to talk about we need we need uh more things to disagree about uh so that we can we can create some some stronger alliances in america i mean when did we get so brittle that's uh it's um it's really, it's really disturbing. Well, I wonder if some of this is, is about social sorting, right? The Democratic and Republican parties have become more uniform in terms of um, the, so the demographic backgrounds of the parties internally to some extent. The, Democra the demographics, the geography, the cultural touchstones of these parties. And so I think some of the animosity between the parties might be attributable to this sort of self-sorting that may, maybe it existed before in our society, but it's just kind of recalibrated now. I wonder if you, do you have any response or thoughts about that idea? Yeah, I, I, I certainly think that that, uh, that is, is part of it, which is, and, and, and then we have to, we have to take a step back and ask, well, what is, what, if, if, if I'm a, if I'm a, a citizen who, who's looking to sort, uh, what do I see in the democratic party? Uh, if I'm not a member of the Democratic Party, what do I see in the Republican Party if I'm not a member of the Republican Party yet? And um, and what's leading me to to sort in that direction? And this is why you know I think I think people like Romney, Sass, Cheney, uh, Kitzinger, uh, uh, there are like to see a reemergence of Ed Gillespie. You know, uh, there there is a there is a a a, a Republican Party that. That that stands for something and has stood for something really important. Uh, and right now, um, the irony of American politics is when a party loses because it it has become too extreme, it gets more extreme, because the people that lose aren't the the the, the most extreme deep red uh, folks. They're the people in the in the purple purple districts and. Um, I would like to see. I would like to hear more and and perhaps we will more from Mitt Romney in the future because I think he, he he may emerge as a really important voice about what what the party could stand for and give give some other voters a, a another reason to sort into that party because I, and I really I really mean this despite the 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 tone of the book and the subject of the book I believe a responsible robust republican party is is essential Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I heartily agree with that. Um, moving back to, to Q&A, we have a question from uh, Chris here, which is, is there a cyclical pattern of political distrust like Skoranek's 32-year cycle of political time? Skoranek is a, a famous scholar of American uh, political institutions and history, for those who might not be aware. Uh, and if so, uh, where are we in this 32-year cycle? And can you offer some insights into what to expect for the 2024 race? And I just want to add one other thing to that. Um, you know, one thing that I, I thought reading the chapters I had was that it seemed as though you had this idea, or I got the idea from the book, that sort of political trust is in some ways the baseline, um, and distrust is the deviance. I, I'm not so sure that's true. Um, I mean, if you look, Pat, if you look, and you actually mentioned earlier these these political leaders in Congress did not view themselves as enemies because they both stormed the beach at Normandy, you know, so to speak. Um, I do wonder if, if trust is really a post-World War II phenomenon and we're just seeing the unwinding of those, those few generations here. So I wonder if you might um, talk a little bit about, about the, the long history of, of distrust in response to Chris's question. Sure, um, two, two great 
great issues. And uh, Chris's question is something that I've been thinking about a lot. Uh, I mentioned this to Amy uh, a, a, a while ago that and, and I think of it in Skoranek terms, but I also think of it in terms of Walter Dean Burnham and, 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 and realignment theory, which, which also has its 36 year uh, uh, cyclical nature. That are there these moments when a, a political system itself, um, a, a regime, a realignment uh, calls itself into question that is my, my view of, of, of realignment theory and, and to some extent Skoranek has always been that um, institutions get built for a certain moment. They succeed, they entrench, they last, they outlast their usefulness, they decay, they decline. And I'm wondering if this distrust is that last, is, is the opposition's last stage uh, uh, strategy. And it, it certainly was a strategy of the populists who said, you know, we don't want to, we don't want a government for the corporations and by the corporations. We want a government for the people and by the people. And um, so I think, I think there may be something to this that the Jacksonians were certainly trying to discredit uh, the, the the Federalist uh, uh, administration that that had come before, uh, and. Um, so, so I think there probably is something to that. That, that, again, the the, the regime itself gets gets overlaid on um, the broader political system. Um, the other, the other, the question you, what you added, Colin, was was also really astute. Uh, our our chapter two really gets into this history, right, from Edmund Burke to uh, to. Uh, to William Buckley, uh, uh, we get into this 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 history of um, trust and distrust as as we argue a central axis on which you can understand American politics. That uh, the anti federalists wanted to distrust distant power. The 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 federalists were saying we have more in common than you think, uh, and 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 we can build a system the uh, that that would accommodate it. Um, the 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 secessionist versus versus Lincoln, that this is uh, you're absolutely right. Trust is not the default, but trust itself was built, and you identified exactly that moment. Amy did a lot of work uh, prior to our prior to our latest collaboration that looked at uh, the government's use of polling during World War II to build belief in the political system and then to translate the, 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 the benefits of, of citizen trust in, um, in the government, in the war effort into citizen trust in, in domestic policy. And you're absolutely right. Trust was, was built, self-consciously built, built with some of the first political polling paid for by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, of all things. Uh, uh, it, trust was built self-consciously by Roosevelt and Truman and then unwound uh, in, in the half century that followed. Yeah, great. I think that's a that's great. I, I look forward to reading chapter two of the book then, so to get more details on that. So um, thanks for that. Um, and then we have uh, one last question from Heather, um, and her question is: Do you see the economic fallout of COVID as a way to create a bipartisan country, as we see some of the proposed policy from the Biden administration? Um, is there hope that leaders will make a decision to get on board with their constituents in this effort? And I think you mentioned this a little before about the, the aftermath of COVID as a moment for forging some kind of new trust. But um, I wonder, you talked about the vaccinations, but we still are dealing with this economic component. So I thought you, perhaps you could talk a bit about that. Sure. I, 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 guess, I guess it's my, um, my, my hopeful disposition uh, but 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 I would I would certainly hope that that the the rebuild and and the reengagement that that we'll all have with with one another or we're, we're already having with one another as a result of this will um, as a result of coming out of this will uh, will will strengthen that I I do think that um, that the government somebody who who looks at the economic uh, response to COVID. Um, needs to self-consciously 
and 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 in a in, in a, a planned way start to start to very cautiously claim some credit right you know if if your favorite pizza shop is still open 14 months later um did they get a ppp loan and uh and uh you know because we do have this belief and i know obama got in a lot of trouble with the you didn't build that we do have this belief that this is all done as a result of market activity and individual initiative and 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 i think that all of those things are really important for uh for america but uh you know people were given an opportunity to to survive um and and that that i think there needs to be an awareness of of what government's role was and uh i i look forward to the sort of spate of uh pandemic response books books from political scientists and policy experts that that will tell us you know what worked and what didn't work that this we might look back at this as a time of real innovation uh and 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 because of the massive government uh uh investments we'll we'll learn more about what kinds of policy instruments work and what kinds of policy instruments are open to corruption what kinds of policy instruments don't really work as we thought they did because we had to um in a, in a problemistic way we had to get out uh, we had to figure out uh what might work and we did a lot of innovating really fast I would assume that by reading MA and government theses in the next several years, I will learn a lot about the uh, post-pandemic response and the economics of it. So uh, I look forward to learning about that from our students in the, the near future. Um, Dorothea, do you have any last comments or questions you'd like to ask Doug? No, I just want to thank Doug. I, this was fascinating. I can't wait to read the whole book, but I, I, I like that you brought it. You brought it back to Madison too, because I think that's so important to have that tapestry, as you put it, of having different beliefs and building trust. You know, with we, despite any ideological differences that we may have, and not letting that tear tear apart. You know that you know respect and belief in our institutions. Uh, that Madison, of course, create you know was instrumental in building. So, thank you. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you so much, Doug. I really appreciate the chance to hear about your work. And uh, for anyone listening, don't forget to pick up a copy of At War with Government, How Conservatives Weaponized Distrust from Goldwater to Trump, forthcoming uh, later this summer from Doug Harris and Amy Freed. So um, thanks all for joining us. It's been a great conversation. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at another event in the future. Bye, all. <laughs>